Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. I A very warm welcome to our service of communion and holy baptism. A particular welcome to Remy, who becomes the newest member of Christ's church this morning through the sacrament of baptism. Welcome to our family and friends and to all who are here to support her today. Jesus Christ, whom we worship, is our crucified, risen, and ascended Lord, and we have walked with him through his journey of life. We have faced the agony of his suffering and death on the cross. We have rejoiced in his bursting free from the bonds of death. We have enjoyed his risen presence with us and his revelation of himself through the breaking of bread. We have seen his return to the throne before which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And now, with the followers of his own time, we await the coming of the promised Holy Spirit, his gift to his people, through whom we make Christ known to the world. As we wait in silence, as we listen to your word, as we worship you in majesty, as we long for your refreshing, as we long for your renewing, as we long for your equipping, as we long for your empowering, we sing the hymn number 302, Lord God the Holy Ghost, in this accepted us. Jesus Christ, 
our Lord. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sign the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speak in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it? that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Tricia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya beyond Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speak about God's deep deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine, but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And the young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above, and signs on earth below, blood and fire and smoke and mist. The sun shall not turn. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. We stand to sing the gradual hymn 112.
gospel reading from John, beginning to read at chapter 15. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the gospel of our Saviour Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When the advocate, advocate comes, whom will I send to you from the Father? The Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my lips and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever been on holidays in a foreign country and had trouble either being understood or, or understanding someone else? Uh, if, if you go to, to order a meal or to ask for directions or to try and find the bathroom, it can be a bit of a challenge if you don't understand the language. I don't know about you, but I was awful at languages in school. I could do well, logical things like songs, but I couldn't do languages at all. And I, I struggled through years of Irish and French and did as little as humanly possible and tried to get out of them as quickly as I could because I hated them so much. I, I remember one Sunday years ago, I was on holidays in France and I thought to myself, well, I'll try and go to church and see how I get on. Well, the first reader got up and they read it speed in a very thick rural French accent. And I didn't have a blind notion of what they were reading. Second reader got up in the same, and then somebody got up and did the prayers, and then eventually the preacher got up. And it wasn't too bad. He preached quite slowly, quite deliberately, and spoke quite clearly, and it gave my brain time to process. And I reckoned I got the gist of what he was trying to get at. I didn't get all the funny little jokes, uh, I didn't get all the asides, but I got the general point of what he was talking about. Do sometimes even speaking to someone who talks the same language can be a challenge? I remember when I was in school, I spent a summer, a, a, a couple of weeks ago in summer, on a scheme with people from all over Ireland. And there was a fellow from Cork, and it was the devil's job to try and understand a word he came out with. They really had to stop and think and concentrate and ask him to slow down and repeat and say it again and again. But then the three weeks, we were starting to get an idea of how to translate it. It was hard work. Then the summer after, a group of us went over to England for a summer scheme, and it was the same thing. The poor English folk didn't have an idea of what we were talking about when we spoke to each other. They kept saying to us, Irish people talk so quickly. And we had to really slow down and try and make every word understandable so they could get a grasp of what we were trying to say. Wouldn't it be awful easy if we all spoke the same language all the time? Wouldn't it make life so simple that if you went off to Spain on your holidays, you'd, you could just go in and say, a pint of beer, and they'd know what you're talking about. Or fish and chips, roast beef. And uh, it'd make life very simple if everyone spoke the same language. At the beginning of scripture, right back in the book Genesis, Everyone spoke the same language. <coughs> and there's a story in Genesis chapter 11. It's not a story we read very often in church. In fact, I can't think of the last time it came up in the, the cycle of readings we use. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. In that story, everyone is speaking the one language, and they go to build a great city. And in the city, they go to build a tower that reaches up into the heavens so that they can reach up and be with God. And God comes down and he frustrates them and the tower isn't built. But when we remember 
that story. And then we read the Pentecost story in Acts chapter 2. We see an old problem being rectified. Because in Acts chapter 2 we have a group of people who speak all sorts of different languages. And God bless the reader who gets the short straw for this week every year. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, and you know, Judea, Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia. It's probably one of the biggest tongue twisters that comes up in our readings. But people with lots of different languages suddenly listening to one another and understanding and being understood. The problems that entered the world in the Tower of Babel have been dealt with. In Pentecost, the Holy Spirit takes those old sins and deals with them and leads the people back into God's way. In the Gospel reading, John records some words of Jesus. And Jesus says, the Spirit will lead us into all truth. And I've been wondering about that phrase for most of this week. The Spirit will lead us. See, if you lead somebody, it's generally to somewhere. If you're lost in school, somebody might lead you to your classroom. Uh, if you're here, somebody might, well, I suppose they might lead you to the shop, but more likely they might lead you into the pub and lead you astray. Or they could lead you to weird and wonderful places like Pomeroy or Bally Bally if you can't find a way. But usually people lead you somewhere. Occasionally we use that phrase uh, of, of an officer leading uh, an army into battle. And he might lead an army, but it's usually them to a place. He'd lead them into the Somme, or he'd lead them into Messine, or he'd lead them to Trafalgar, or one of the great battles. It's always to a place. So where is truth? How do we find truth? But later on in, in the Gospel of John, John records more words of Jesus, where Jesus says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. So when the Holy Spirit is going to lead us into all truth, what Jesus is saying is he's not going to lead, you, lead us to a place. He's going to lead us to a person. And that person is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit is our leader and our guide in this life. When I was a teenager, there was a great craze for wearing little uh, wristbands, bracelets, with the words and letters, WWJD on them. What would Jesus do? And the idea was that they were there to remind you that every time you had to make a decision, you'd look at your wrist and say, well, what would Jesus do? And if you're feeling a bit irate and angry and wanting to punch somebody in school, you should look at the bracelet and say, well, what would Jesus do? If you're going to make a big decision in life, some sort of important choice, what would Jesus do? Every, every day we should be asking ourselves, well, what would Jesus do? And then, am I doing what Jesus would do? Or am I doing something completely different? And wouldn't it be a great thing to be able to ask Jesus, well, what would you do here? Tough, tough day. I need some advice. What would you do? Big decision to make. What would you do? Those life altering decisions. Uh, what would you do? Now, if Jesus was still here walking on the face of the earth, can you imagine how many people would be ahead of you in the queue to ask them what to do? How many millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people want to go and say, Jesus, tell me what you do. I'll do the same. But the queue would be longer than I would ever stand in. I'm not very patient when I'm queuing. Whether it's in, in the line in Tesco or waiting for the teller at the bank or in a queue in the, in the on the motorway, I'm not, I'm not a patient cure. But Jesus told us that when he would return and ascend back to his Father, he would send us another comforter, an advocate, the spirit of truth who would lead us into all truth. So we all have a spirit with us each and every day. And if we want to find the right path, we ask God's Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. The Holy Spirit is God's greatest gift to us. And every day, every morning, our first prayer should be for God to send the Holy Spirit to guide us.
to direct us that day, to lead us in the right path, to show us the right way to go. Because when we're left to our own devices, we're a bit like the people of Babel. We have bright ideas, and those ideas are usually fairly rubbish ideas, because we're following our own path. But when we follow God's way, he leads us in the right path. When the Holy Spirit leads us, it will always be to truth. And that truth is Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is God's way of communicating with us and talking to us and inspiring us. And Peter is talking about all that has happened. To describe it, he reaches back into one of the wonderful prophecies of the Old Testament. To those words of Joel written hundreds of years earlier but foretelling what was to come. Joel, in those ancient Hebrew words, says, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. There we have God's word of promise. His Holy Spirit will be poured out. And it will be poured out on all people. On men and women. On old and young. On slave and free. But God doesn't just make a promise to his chosen nation, to the children of Israel. Or to a select group of people. Or to a tribe or to a language or a culture. Or to any particular group. His promise is to all people. In all times. His spirit is with us now. If we simply call upon him and ask for that spirit to be our guide and our direction. And Peter ends that great challenge and promise that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But ultimately, the path of life only has two directions. We might think we have lots of roads to choose, lots of paths that we can choose to walk, but there are only two paths we can take. The path that leads us to God or the path that walks away from God. Either we're facing God and walking towards Him or we're turning our backs to Him and walking the other way. Either we end up in a life lived with God or a life cut off and alienated from God. There is no middle path, no in between way. Either we call on the name of the Lord and are saved or we walk away from God. And baptism is where it all begins. Baptism is the beginning of that wonderful journey. Because in baptism we become God's own child by adoption and grace. Part of his family and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. In baptism, parents and godparents make solemn vows and promises about bringing a child up in the life of faith. To help that child to know and love God and ultimately to come to that point in life where they can from their own lips, call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Baptism is a wonderful moment. It is a special moment because God claims this little life as its own. From now on, Remy belongs to God. But as wonderful as it is today, we should never forget that it is only the beginning. The hard work begins after today. The hard work is helping her to grow up, to know and love and trust and follow and serve God, to hear the voice of God and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. No matter where we are on our walk with God, we're never too old, too knowledgeable or smart or clever to cope without the leading of God's Holy Spirit. Every year on this feast of Pentecost, the focus of our worship is on the Holy Spirit. But every day, every morning as we awake and get out of bed and say our prayers, our first thought should be, come Holy Spirit. Come, be with me today. Lead me, direct me, guide me. Keep me on the right path today and every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus.
Jesus Christ has told us that to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, and has given us baptism as a sign and seal of this new birth. Here we are washed by the Holy Spirit and made free. Here we are clothed with Christ, dying to sin that we might live his busy life. As children of God, we have a new dignity, and God calls us to fullness of life. Only baptism is administered to infants on the understanding that they will be brought up in the fellowship of Christ's church, that they will be taught the Christian faith, and that when they publicly confess this faith, they will be confirmed by the church and admitted to the Holy Communion. As we come to baptize let me, I'd ask the congregation to stand and turn and face the cross. And if any of the children are here want to come down and join me, they're welcome to the cross for a closer view of the baptism. service there are a number of parts. The first part is the presentation and the decision where the parents and godparents present their child for baptism and are asked to make vows and promises about bringing her up in the love and faith of the Christian community. So I'll be giving a series of questions to the parents and godparents. <coughs> we welcome she comes to be baptized. I invite her sponsors to present her now. Parents and godparents, will you accept the responsibilities placed upon you in bringing them for baptism and answer on her behalf? By your own prayers and example, by your teaching and love, will you encourage her in the life and faith of the Christian community? And baptism really begins her genuine faith. You speak for her today. Will you care for her and help her to take her place within the life and worship of Christ's church? Baptism, God calls us from darkness to his marvellous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore I ask, do you reject the devil and all proud rebellion against God? Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbor? Do you turn to Christ as Saviour? Do you submit to Christ as Lord? And do you come to Christ, the way, the truth, and the life? Now the parents and godparents have made their vows and promises. It takes to help the law to support the encouragement, not just of family and friends, but of the entire family of God in the church to keep those promises in the years ahead. And so I ask you all, you have heard these our brothers and sisters who song to Christ. Will you support them in this call? <laughs> Remy, Christ gave you wisdom. Receive the sign of the cross. Live as a disciple of Christ. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. Confess that he is crucified. Proclaim his resurrection. Look for his coming in the Remy, the Almighty God, deliver you from powers of darkness. Restore you the image of his glory. And lead you in the light and obedience of Christ. The next part of baptism is a, a prayer of blessing over the water. A prayer in which we remember the ways we read of water in scripture as a sign of God's presence, his, his protection, and his cleansing. And we pray all these things for the in the life that lies ahead of him. Praise God in heaven and earth. Give Jesus promise prayer. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our grace. We thank the Almighty God for the gift of water. To sustain, refresh, and cleanse all life. Over water, the Holy Spirit moved from the beginning of creation. Through water, you led the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. In water, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as Messiah, the Christ, to lead us to the death of sin and newness of life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we baptize into his fellowship those who come to him in faith. Now sanctify this water, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, she may be cleansed from sin and born again. 
renewed in your image. May she walk with a light of faith and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit we are honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. The next part of the baptism is to profess the faith into which Remy is to be baptised. But first I have one final question to put to the parents and godparents. Do you believe and accept the Christian faith into which Remy is to be baptised? And brothers and sisters, I ask you to profess together the faith of the Church. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in God the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Lord, who was to see God. I mean, in the name of the Father, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God has called you into his church. We therefore see you and welcome you as a member of us of the Father, as a child of the Lord Heavenly Father, and as an heir of the kingdom of God. Remy, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Now and all. Amen. <clears throat> Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God and body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The hymn of the Apathy number 294, Come Down on the Night.
Christ taught us with his sacrifice of hearts. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. This day we give you thanks because of the fulfillment of your promise. You pour out your Spirit upon us, filling us with your gifts, leading us into all truth, and uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith. Your Spirit gives us grace to call you, Father, to proclaim your gospel to all nations, and to serve you as our royal priesthood. Therefore, we join our voices with angels and our angels, and with all those in whom the Spirit dwells, to proclaim the glory of your name, forever praising you and singing.
Jesus Christ that you gave me, and his blood which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you and lives for you, and feel him in your heart by faith with that soul. Faithful God, who fulfilled the promises of Easter by sending us your Holy Spirit and opening to every race and nation the way of life at home, open our lips by your Spirit that every tongue may tell of your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> For fifty days we have celebrated the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ over the powers of sin and death. We have proclaimed God's mighty acts and we have prayed that the power that was at work when God raised Jesus from the dead might be at work in us. As part of God's church here in this place, I call you to live out what you proclaim. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, will you dare to walk into God's future, trusting Him to be your God? Will you dare to embrace each other and grow together in love? Will you dare to share your riches in common? And minister to each other in need. Will you dare to pray for each other until your hearts beat with the longings of God? Will you dare to carry the light of Christ into the world's dark places? The Spirit of truth lead you to all truth. Give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and proclaim the words and works of God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Before I find him, another announcements. Uh, some are on the sheet and quite a few of them aren't. First of all, some of those that aren't on the sheet, first of all, a huge thank you to everyone who came along yesterday morning and worked so hard uh, with chainsaws and shovels and spades and uh, all the work was done tidying up. It was absolutely extraordinary to see how much was achieved in a couple of hours. Uh, Noel says, the, the good news is you did so well, you got the next week off. And maybe then another week or two, come back and do a bit more. But thank you all. Thank you everyone who came along. It, it really was a great day's work around the grounds. The 6th of June is the anniversary of D-Day. And this year is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And around the country there are special celebration services and the lighting of beacons that night. The local one is in our man in Cathedral. It's on, it's on Thursday the 8th of June at 8 o'clock. And the lighting of the beacon will follow afterwards about 9, quarter past 9. As soon as the service is over, everyone will slide the ground and slide the beacon. Uh, every parish has been asked or given a, an allocation of seats for that service. So if you'd like to come along, uh, just let me know and I'll put your name on the list. There's plenty of space, but uh, it, it's, it is limited and it's a certain number, so if you'd like to follow along, let me know. That's Thursday the 6th of June. Third one, which isn't on the announcement sheet, and that's next Sunday at 3 o'clock, there's an Adventist Boys of Family service here in St. Michael's. And then a few things come up that are on the sheet. Uh, I'll go back to front, just to confuse you. The bottom one, the Havana Youth Choir. The choir are here on Tuesday week. The tickets are available. If, a lot of people got tickets last week, but if you didn't get tickets, see me after the service. As with all these things, we can't just cram in everyone that turns up on the night. There has to be there are health and safety rules that have to be followed. So every seat is allocated with a ticket. So if you'd like to come, get a ticket. You don't have to pay me today. You can bring the money in the next week or on the night, but get your ticket to reserve your seat. Tickets are five pounds each. I said there's no issue of paying today. Next week or on, on the night, the will do. Then, two more things that both in the cathedral. First of all, Sunday the 9th of June at 11 o'clock, Rhonda Dempsey and Jackie Carson are being ordained as speakers in the cathedral. And both Rhonda well, there are several others as well, there are four people being ordained, but two of them are being ordained to serve in this parish group for the next year. And Rhonda and Jackie will be starting here after the summer holidays and serving here for at least the next 12 months as part of their training for ordination. So we're, there'll be no service here on the morning of the 9th of June. We're going to 
pack our bags, get into our cars, and head off to let the people support and encourage Donna and Jackie. So don't turn up here at half past 11, and another white door's locked. If you're here at half 11, you're late and you've missed the service. The service is 11 o'clock in the cathedral, and it'd be, it'd be great to see as many people as possible there to support them, because they'll be here for at least a year. I'm hoping that a year could be extended a little bit further, but we'll, we'll see how the first 12 months go. So that's the 9th of June in the morning, and then the 16th of June, you'll know the road car well done. Because on the 16th of June, uh, Elizabeth is being commissioned as a pastoral visitor for the parish, also in the cathedral. But that was in the afternoon, so I have our normal mornings here. And then quarter past three in the afternoon, uh, the commissioning of parish readers, diocesan readers, and pastoral visitors to serve across the diocese. And again, Elizabeth is uh, well known to you all, and I know you all want to be there to support her and encourage her. So that's 9th of June and 16th, 1 in the morning, 1 in the afternoon. Our final hymn, number 308, Revive your church, O Lord, in grace and power join you. Go in the peace of the risen Christ. Hallelujah. 